and to talk to you about the gospel today. There's some powerful lessons in the gospel today. Anybody who's spent time with me knows uh, that I have been somewhat preoccupied by an extraordinary artist by the name of Renoir and his phenomenal story. And his story goes like this, that he began painting, but the last 20 years of his work, his amazing, talented work, was done in the grips of horrendous pain. He had arthritis in his hands so bad that they would twist, and he could barely hold the brush. The arthritis in his arms were so bad that he couldn't lift his arms above his head. His assistants needed to move the canvas so that he could paint parts of his exquisite painting. He sat in a chair, he couldn't stand up because the arthritis in his pain in his back was so bad that they had to move him around in the chair. And one day, one of his young assistants asked the following question, why don't you give up? Why don't you walk away? What's wrong with you? You've already accomplished so much. Why don't you walk away from And he looked at one of his paintings and he said, because the pain will pass away, but the beauty will remain. Before this morning's gospel, Jesus had just sat down with the disciples and said, I'm dying. That's not easy when somebody you love tells you that. He explained to them that it was God's plan that he would be born, he would live, he would teach, he would love, he would die, and he would rise again. And not all the disciples took it well. Matter of fact, one of them rebuked him. That means he took him on, got him in a corner and said, not going to happen. As long as I'm around, nobody's going to touch you. You're safe. And Jesus got a little upset and turned to him and said, get behind me, Satan. A phrase that means you don't know what you're talking about. Your thoughts must be of this world rather than the next. And yet, Jesus, as you look at your gospel today in the pamphlet, Jesus gathers two or three of his disciples. He doesn't take them all, does he? Matter of fact, if I remember correctly, if you look with me, you will see that Jesus takes Peter, John, and James. Why is that important? It's important because Jesus understood the importance of surrounding ourselves in two or three people that we can trust implicitly no matter what happens. We want them there in the worst of times and in the best of times, and we know that we are not meant to live this journey on our own. I know those who are loyal to me, they come to me first. I go around them. They come to me first. And in my private life, I surround myself with two or three men that I trust implicitly. And if there's issues, whether they be of my marriage, or of the church, or of my personal life, I have two or three men that I trust implicitly. If it's issues of the church, it's another priest, another pastor. For issues of confidentiality. If it's issues about my marriage, I'll bounce it off a guy who's been married 30 to 50 years. Nothing I can't stand if somebody gives marriage advice and never been married. <laughs> and if it's about kids, I go to a friend whose kids are in their 40s. I figure by then, they've grown up so is he. <laughs> two or three people that you trust implicitly. Jesus took two or three people that he trusted implicitly for good times and in bad. We all need those two or three. Women need women and men need men in order to be able to build you up, encourage you, support you, and love you in good times and bad. It's a very important lesson in the gospel today. The second thing that happens is that these three get together, and it's quite clear that they've done some climbing. It's possible that it was Mount Carmen, and then it's a bit of a climb, and they get out there, they've been out for a long time. And they go off. Happens to 
some of us. We even missed conversations. <laughs> we started watching TV, and then we up and up, end up in a particular posture. It's nice the lazy boy goes a long way back. We can say we're watching TV, but we usually figure it out when we're snoring. <laughs> they dozed off. They were tired, they were exhausted, and they almost missed it. The transfiguration of Jesus Christ, when God encountered Christ in such a powerful way that he glowed in the dark. We miss stuff when we're tired. Some of us are known to get a little lumpy, a little edgy. Some of us just forget stuff. Some of us some process, but not as well as we would if we had a full night's sleep. We miss things. We, we don't necessarily see things the way we should. And then we blame everybody else. Because we haven't had enough rest. Our bodies are designed as the temple of God. That's scriptural. But they're meant to be treated with rest. To prepare us for the challenges of the day ahead. And while we don't have enough rest and we're edgy with others, it's really not their fault, it's ours. The disciples posted. They missed it. I don't know if I've ever shared this story with you before, but I was crossing the American border. We decided to go across at about 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm traveling with the Winter Police chaplain, Chuck Humber. He also happens to be the pastor of the largest Presbyterian church in Ontario. And uh, a phenomenal guy, a, a real treat to be with. He's got a badge in the front window. We come up to the American border, and I'm aware I'm like, being taped today, so let me just say this about the American border. I think I'm really comfortable over here. <laughs> <laughs> we get to the border, and we have to hand over our passports. It's in the middle of the night, 4 o'clock in the morning. I consider that the middle of the night. And so with the border guard, I think he might have been dozing. Takes our passports. Next thing I know, there's six guys running in the corner with automatic weapons drawn. I'm ordered out of the car, and I'm incarcerated. Apparently, I'm wanted for attempted murder <laughs> in Detroit. I go in, the border guard comes in, looks at me, the receiving guard, while I'm standing there and holding, Chuck Conlon turns to me and said, I'm never traveling with you again. <laughs> the second guard looks at the screen with the passport. Apparently my passport picture isn't easy to see in the middle of the night. But the next guy, that's an 8 by 10 on the screen. And he looks at me and he says, you're white. He said that your name is Stephen James Henry for February 2nd, 1965. Uh -huh. By the way, by now, I needed a second pair of pants. <laughs> <laughs> he says, you're white. Uh-huh. <laughs> Get out. Apparently, there is an African-American in Detroit who was wanted for attempted murder, whose name was Stephen James Henry, born February 2nd, 1965. My guess is, you can't visit him right now. <laughs> we miss things when we're tired. The disciples almost missed the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. <coughs> and they woke up and they saw the glory of his face, the glowing robes, the glow in the dark of Christ. Then the cloud came on them. Now, I don't know about you, but apparently weather changes affect some people's behavior. There's some scientific evidence to show it. Like, it's not supposed to be this warm in the middle of February. It's okay, there's a huge storm coming. Everything will balance out. But some people don't respond to the weather changes. 
particularly if they have like, other issues that they struggle with. This cloud descends on them. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah shows up, and Jesus is standing in the middle, and the disciples freak. God speaks. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. This is the second time God's done this, because apparently the first time some people were sleeping, and they missed it at the baptism. So he came back to do it again, just in case they missed it. The cloud disappears, Jesus is standing alone, and the disciples are on the ground. Jesus says, do not be afraid, stand up. It says they don't say anything. They don't say anything at all from that moment. But what you need to know is that Jesus has shared a sacred and holy and intimate moment with them. He models that we need each other to surround ourselves with those people we care. He models that God can do amazing things. And now the disciples have witnessed his glory so that they are prepared to deal with whatever's coming next. Some of you can remember your wedding. The best man, maid of honor. Bridesmaid, man of honor. I trust that they weren't just for show that they were meant to be there in your lives for a lifetime. Well, why else did you show them? Why were they there? I trust that you have two or three best friends. I had an interesting experience once. I borrowed somebody's vehicle, and on the way home from the trip, it broke down. So I called them from the side of the 401. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. I said, I'm in your vehicle, and it broke down on the side of the 401. And the response was, you should call for help. <laughs> I didn't say to him. People think that they are the natural critic of a church, natural critic of every relationship. I don't need somebody telling me what's wrong with me. I already know. I live here. I need somebody who's going to say, here's the possible solutions, here's the possible answers. This is how we can stand up together. You don't think I know how messed up I am? If you don't know how messed up you are, ask somebody that loves you. Don't tell me. But we really don't need that. What we need are the people that simply say, let's dust you off. Lift you up. I'll hold on tight, you seem a little dizzy. Let's start again. Those are the kinds of people that Jesus surrounded himself with. And he gave us that extraordinary model. Now theologically, this is a tremendous moment in the moment of this church because it is the second time that God acknowledges that Jesus is the divine choice to be the Messiah and the Savior of the world. He does it in the presence of witnesses again, and he positions us to enter into the most holy time of church absence of the year. Let me say that again, just in case a few didn't hear me. As we enter into the most extraordinary time of church absence of the year, this is what happens. <laughs> which, by the way, is going to stop. We exit. This is why you think I'm going to spend four weeks of Lent telling you how bad you are. Who needs that? I'd rather watch Smurfs. Have a nice breakfast. Stay in bed. You think you don't want to come? Maybe I don't want to come. What you're going to hear in the next four weeks of Lent are the tools that we need to sharpen our spiritual swords for the battle of living a life of love. You don't want to miss that. You don't want to miss that. Every single Sunday, I promise you, you're going to feel better when you leave than when you walk in. 
which believe me is a whole lot better than feeling better when you leave. Because you never went in the first place. Lent is a sacred and holy time of rebuilding ourselves. Of experiencing love and grace and mercy at the foot of the cross. And that's what you're going to experience. Through our liturgy, through our music, and through the preaching. And I invite you to be part of it. It is a sacred and holy time in the church. Now, let me finish with the end of the gospel. And most preachers, by the way, will do anything to avoid dealing with this part of the gospel. Suddenly, the Spirit sees him, and all at once, he shrieks. It throws him into convulsions until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and it will scarcely leave him. I beg your disciples to cast it out, but they couldn't. Jesus answered, you faithless and perverse generation. Okay. Jesus didn't get a nap. <laughs> He's tired. You see, Jesus was fully human and fully divine. Now, Bill will appreciate this because his Bible study group is struggling with this. So let me unpack it a little bit. God gave Jesus a human body and a divine soul and sent him into this world and said, teach them pure love and you can do it because your soul is purely divine. And the balance says your body is fully human. And so Jesus, like any other man, got tired, a little irritable or edgy once in a while. But immediately acted in love and granted healing to that young boy. We get fixated on what was wrong with the kid anyway. Oh, diagnosis of that. This is what you need to know. When he walked up to Jesus, he lived a life of torture. When he walked away, he was healed. The pain will pass away and the beauty remains. When you leave this place today, I want that in your soul. Some of you are struggling in your marriages. Some have been to the doctor and got some bad news. Some of you are struggling in retirement. Some of you are struggling with finances. Some are struggling with the everyday aches and pains of life. But you need to know the pain will pass away. And the beauty of Christ's love in your 